Welcome everybody. It's hard to believe that this is the 104th episode of the Royal Society of Medicine's COVID-19 series and I am Professor Gillian Lang and I'm hosting today's discussion and the focus of this session is to provide an update on the mutations, on the coronavirus mutations and how they are driving up infection rates across the UK. And of course, importantly, in the context of what does that mean for patients? What does that mean for practitioners? And what does that mean for research? So I've got a few questions lined up, but just a reminder to everyone that you can also add your own questions through the Q&A function. And it's always really great to get those questions because it, it adds to the feeling that we're all involved in, a, in an online discussion. So I have got three guests today. I'm joined by Professor Lawrence Young, Dr. Thomas Peacock, and Professor Emma Thompson. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a moment to say something briefly about their roles. And I've asked them to flag up what they see as the key challenges for the next six to nine months as we get through the coming winter. So, uh, Lawrence, could you kick us off, please? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lawrence Young. I'm a professor of molecular oncology at the University of Warwick. I have a long standing interest in persistent virus infections and how these contribute to chronic diseases, mainly cancer, but also autoimmune conditions like multiple sclerosis. I'm particularly interested on, in the, uh, the impact of COVID on, on reactivation of persistent virus infections like herpes viruses and how these influence both acute uh, and long COVID. I've also been in really interested in the, the gender differences we've seen between the impact of COVID in the acute context and in terms of long COVID. I think in terms of key challenges, is really going to focus around the unpredictability of what's happening with variants. We don't know what variants are going to arrive next. We can't rule out the possibility that some of these variants could lead to increased disease severity and higher hospitalization rates. So that's going to impact the way we think about vaccination against new variants. I'm sure that's something we're going to be discussing in more detail. I'm also particularly interested in the impact of variants and repeat infections on long COVID. So those are my two big areas, really. Brilliant, thank you, Lawrence. And next, Tom, Thomas Peacock. Hi, I'm Tom. Um, I'm a virologist at uh, Imperial College London. Um, I'm also an advisor for UK uh, HSA. Um, so I've spent most of my career working on pandemic viruses um, pre prior to this influenza, uh, particularly avian and swine influenza, um, but obviously more recently been working on uh, COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so my main interest is in variants and trying to identify and characterize variants, both from a, um, a kind of uh, a surveillance perspective, but also from a virological perspective. Um, so the, the, the big challenges going forward, obviously, you know, we, we are in the third, well, we're just coming out of the third wave of, of, of Omicron infection since November, which is obviously been putting huge uh, stress on the NHS in particular. Um, but trying to, you know, it, does that pattern continue? Does something brand new come along or do we get into a more of a seasonal pattern? It's, it's very, very difficult to say uh, how, how the, what the future of this virus is going to look like. It, it, I mean... Presumably, we think it's going to carry on looking like it is, but maybe something will happen that's unexpected. Um, as well as that, there's a real importance for updating the vaccines um, and trying to put some sort of framework in to have rapid updates, um, in, similar to influenza, for example, because at the moment it's taking really quite a long time to update these vaccines. Um, but I think these are kind of the biggest challenges that we have uh, going forward in the next six months or so. OK, thank you. Um, unpredictability is coming through as a bit of a theme so far. Emma. Hi, uh, my name is Emma Thompson. I'm clinical professor of infectious diseases at the MRC University of Glasgow Centre of Virus Research and within NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And uh, I, I also work a bit on um, variants, genetic variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And um, I think that there are many challenges for us in the six to nine months. I thought perhaps you were going to ask about six to nine years. I think there'll be challenges for quite some time. Um, and I think those challenges include some of the things that the other speakers have brought up, uh, particularly adapting vaccines. Um, and I, I think also uh, monitoring severity associated with, with variants is going to be critical. And some of the work that um, Tom has done and, and that we have done have shown that it doesn't take that much for the behaviour of the virus to change. And uh, therefore, we really do need to keep our eyes on the virus. 
Um, and the one other thing which perhaps we're going to be doing today is I think we have a real challenge ahead with tackling misinformation. Mm. Yeah, that's a really, really good point, isn't it? The information question, very big, big discussion we can have around that. <clears throat> uh, I, as I said, we've got the message that uh, mutations are unpredictable, but COVID-19 is a uh, coronavirus. We've had coronaviruses around for forever, probably, haven't we? So is there anything we know that's likely to happen in relation to future mutations? Are they likely to become generally less severe? Is that what normally happens or is it completely unknown? Uh, do, you want, do you want to start to start, Emma, and, and then see what the others Yeah, say? I mean, I, I would say that um, the changes that we've seen in clinical severity with waves of variants have actually been quite heterogeneous. And so alpha was more severe than the original B1 lineages that, uh, that uh, entered the UK, and then delta was more severe than alpha. Mm -hmm. And of course, Omicron has taken a, a dive in severity, but uh, it does. It, we we know that probably the phenotype of the virus reflects some of this change that we've seen in terms of tropism of the virus for lung cells and um, uh, some of the characteristics of the more severe variants. And and it doesn't take much for the virus to change, as Tom uh, will probably be able to add in a lot of detail. But uh, so by random mutation, it may well be the situation that we may um, get a virus which is more severe. And, and we've just seen a steady change in immune evasion, both adaptive and more recently, there's been a good demonstration of changes in evasion of innate uh, immunity as well in BA4 and 5. And um, so I think we have to really watch <laughs> what's happening. Uh, we also have less of an early warning system than we used to have in the UK because our sequencing has reduced so substantially that it's quite difficult for us to, to predict in advance um, what's going on with the virus. Ah, that's an interesting point. Um, Tom, do you want to come in next on that? Anything to add? Yeah, so I guess from a perspective of, you know, we've there's probably been coronaviruses in humans for a long time, but we don't really know we, we have no idea when they enter the population and and we have no way you know SARS-CoV-2 is not acting like we think those viruses act um they it, it is it is very well acting as its own thing and, and in fact actually looking at the veterinary world maybe shines more of a light on the way SARS-CoV-2 has been evolving there are there are some animal coronaviruses that have a kind of a similar massive divergence whereas the human seasonal coronavirus at least they 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 don't have this this huge splits and and jumps and stuff at least not in recent memory you know since, since we've been looking at them closely so so although SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus I don't know I don't know if necessarily yeah, comparisons to the, the human seasonals is is at the moment at least um the the, the best comparison yeah okay thank you and Lawrence yeah, I think I think I think the real concern is that you know we've seen this with BA.5. It's progressed to such a point that even people that have had previous infections with BA.1, BA.2 are now getting infected again. And vaccination is obviously able to prevent severe disease, but not to to block the in, infection itself and the spread. And that's quite an interesting issue about whether we will ever be able to develop approaches to completely block infection. I think it's inevitable. That we're going to have more evolution to come and we know a lot of this is going on in immunocompromised hosts around the world and so there's a big concern with tens of millions of immunocompromised people uh, who are perhaps not being uh, sufficiently managed and helped and supported in terms of vaccines or monoclonal antibodies we are going to continue to see um new variants popping up and i think tom mentioned earlier the degree to which this will end up with a more seasonal infection as we've seen with the common cold coronaviruses at the moment that's looking like a, it's a long way off long way off so that six to nine year time frame is probably a better one than my months <laughs> we've got a few a few questions popping into the the question se section here which i'll pull out but let, let's and i'll try and focus them on on vaccination because that's obviously an interesting point that we've already uh, got into and there's one question here is is it that Omicron is less virulent or that its effects are attenuated due to the public vaccination programme? Perhaps it's a bit of both. I'm not sure. Um, 
Emma? So um, it is both. Uh, there's no question that it's better to be vaccinated and you're, you're very much less likely to end up in hospital or dying of COVID-19 if you're vaccinated. And that's um, quite remarkable given how much the virus has changed over time. But um, also the virus itself is much less, uh, it is less virulent. And we know that from quite controlled data. We've looked at this, for example, within Scotland and in a um, one of the populations in the health boards in Scotland in very a lot of detail, and um, we know that that certainly the BA one and BA two look uh, markedly less likely to cause hospitalisation or death uh, than uh, Delta was. Um, BA four and five, there are hints that uh, these may be a little bit more severe in presentation than BA one and two, unfortunately, but not reaching. I think the the level that we got to with, with Delta. There's another thing that concerns me actually, which is um, unvaccinated people. I, I think as this virus becomes able to tackle uh, what we've set up as a, a big immune barrier against the virus, I, I think it may get um, it, it may get more dangerous. And and we can't. It's not a given that viruses become less virulent with time. I think we we um, must get away from that messaging. Uh, I was taught that in medical school. I don't think with any evidence. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, now I think we've seen enough to know that, that that isn't necessarily the case. I think I was taught that in medical school as well. So I shall <laughs> now forget that. <laughs> I shall forget that piece of information. Uh, <clears throat> it, it, if, if we needed to, um, how quickly could we get vaccinations against a particularly challenging new variant who, who, do you want to ask that one, Emma, or, or would anyone else like to, to, to come in? I think it's, I'm happy to have a go, but yeah. uh, well, I, I mean, I could start really fast and then maybe, you know, maybe Tom would be great to talk about how vaccines need to be adapted. Um, but uh, um, the, the thing that's happened is as, that is transformative is that we have these new technologies which are really can be um, produced really rapidly. So mRNA vaccines in, in particular are extraordinary and the the uh, old manufacturing process of of developing pro, you know using developing proteins in the laboratory which takes ages is gone now and we use uh, our own arms as the laboratory and we just stick in the mrna message and and that means that um, they can be produced more rapidly but there is an issue around licensing still and um, i mean the us are going to give a a combined vaccine um, with with Omicron uh, later in the year. I'm not sure quite yet what's happening in the UK, but uh, um, the, so it's not just the manufacture, but also the licensing process that's going to be really critical. Mm -hmm. so okay. I, yeah. I was going to say, I think this this business of updating vaccines to match circulating variants is clearly an option. But, but it's not going to do it's not going to do chasing variants is going to be very tricky so what's important is that we that we generate vaccines that are able to 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 protect against all variants and there's some very interesting developments in terms of um variant proof vaccines a couple of interesting papers published in the last week or two in in science around demonstrating different approaches to developing some of these nano, nanoparticle based vaccines that are likely to see all beta coronaviruses. So that's one interesting thing. I guess the other issue about vaccines is, is how they're administered. And again, there are some very interesting studies now looking at nasal administration of vaccines. And one way to actually protect from infection is to think about generating an, a mucosal immune response you know, where the virus initially enters the body. Um, many of us have been arguing this from the very beginning. There are a couple of really interesting trials um, going on at the moment couple of them in the UK actually on nasal vaccines so there's hope the question is how soon is it how, you know, how rapidly can we develop these variant proof vaccines into into the clinic mm -hmm. yeah that that really would make a difference wouldn't it and and would the pattern be of a of an annual booster do we think or is it too too early to say yeah, yeah. I think it'd be very likely and that's why we're all, even now obviously there's discussion about the the flu the flu vaccine and the next covid booster jab somehow you know, going together in some way, whatever that booster is likely to be. 
There's lots of great questions. Uh, I'll see how many I can get through. And here's an interesting one. It's moving a bit away from vaccines, but with changing virus variants, will the monoclonal antibody therapies need to be evolving as well? This will be of particular relevance for large numbers of people with immunocompromised uh, patients. I can have a crack at that, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, every every new variant we've been losing, we've been shedding monoclonal antibodies that are effective and, and some of them that were very effective early on. And, and uh, uh, you know, we, we lost with BA1, then BA2 and BA5 and, and whatever comes next probably will have just because the way that these viruses are evolving is antigenically and most of the monoclonal antibodies bind antigenic sites so so um so we're going to constantly be having to cycle through these monoclonals at this rate um you know and and it may be that some come back you know if, if something completely new came along it could be that it has a completely different pattern of sensitivity and resistance to to the existing the pre-existing monoclonal antibodies and certain ones that for example regeneron which is, it does not work against the latest viruses uh could that, that could uh you know come back for example um so but but there's going of constant, you know, there may be some monoclonals. So, well, Satrovimab was originally, uh, you know, touted as being, you know, an area that the virus doesn't mutate, though the virus has now mutated that area as well. Um, the other issue with monoclonals is um, we are starting to see clusters of cases which appear to have monoclonal antibody resistance. So people potentially having monoclonal antibody treatment and the virus escaping. None of these are really taking off, but that's something we really need to be careful about because otherwise you're just burning even you know the, your last remaining monoclonal antibodies so you know making making this is partly the idea of why you want a cocktail of effective antibodies because it's much harder for the virus to generate resistance but a few of the monoclonals so trobimab in particular is used as a as a mono um uh, therapy interesting interesting um emma yeah um i think just a word of caution about the sort of panacea idea of um general vaccines i mean it's great and uh the the idea of targeting an area which is less variable like s2 is really a, a good one but like tom's just said unfortunately even monoclonal antibodies which were in fact originally designed for sars1 um and had activity against sars2 um there was escape and, and uh, if we put that kind of immune pressure on the population it is quite likely that we'll see immune escape over time and we may even need to update vaccines which are um, more general and, and certainly that's what we should be aiming for but uh, they're firstly quite far away from the clinic and secondly um, the, or at least I'm guessing uh, things have moved at such pace that it's always possible that they're not but uh, um, the capacity of the virus to evolve is is high unfortunately and so we we will have to be alert to that. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting strong messages about unpredictability, the need to very much be alert to what's changing. And you made a comment earlier, Emma, about not doing as much sequencing, I think, as we were before. So perhaps you could expand on that. And there's also a question that I don't know much about, but you will, I'm sure, is wastewater still being analysed mm -hmm. for SARS-CoV-2? And what is this showing? <laughs> Uh, do you want me to start then on the? Yeah, yeah if you want to start, someone yeah. else can take the wastewater. The wastewater, maybe, but uh, um, well, I mean, the UK led the world for some period of time with sequencing, and that was through the efforts of the COG UK consortium led by Sharon Peacock, and it was an extraordinary um, endeavour. And uh, some of us on the call were involved with that, and uh, um, we were sequencing at a hugely high scale for some time. We sequenced. Um, millions of, of virus of virus genomes and uh, we were able to monitor really um, accurately how the virus was changing in the UK but that the, with the reduction in testing we, we no longer can do that and um, so we are reliant on smaller uh, study based um, uh, monitoring and that that means that we're a little bit more open to variants emerging that we wouldn't have uh, that we wouldn't have been open to before um, and maybe that's right because the sequencing is very expensive and we do have to reach a balance between um, the cost of sequencing and then the value of it and, and I think we can do intelligent sequencing better and it would be good to see maybe a, an uptick in what we're doing I think at the moment it's probably a bit low 
Um, okay. And, uh, the, you know, there's been some fantastic modelling done by researchers at Imperial College and elsewhere showing the kinds of levels of, of sequencing that we should be doing. And I, I think that uh, it, it would be some, it is something worth considering. Oh, that, that's, that's helpful. And who would like to pick up on the waste of water then? Well, I, 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 I know I, I don't know what's going on now with wastewater, but originally we had a national monitoring program. It was set up in England and it was really quite substantial. I think there was something like monitoring untreated sewage about four times a week from about 270 or 300 different sewage treatment works around the country. So you're able to assess then infection in sewage in more than 40 million people. But I think that's been scaled back significantly because of this assumption this 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 idea which as we've just been discussing is wrongly placed that somehow we don't need to do this anymore we're through the worst of the pandemic and Omricon is milder and I don't know what's going on now but it has been an enormously valuable tool and still is in other countries and obviously as people will be aware recently was used in London to identify that limited outbreak of, of polio yes it was wasn't it yeah yeah um, Tom anything to add yeah, no, it, um, Lawrence is completely right. It's, it's been massively scaled back in the UK. Um, there, there are some very interesting studies from, from the US uh, recently actually showing cryptic wastewater lineages as well. These, these mysterious variants that are never found in people that, that are found in very, very high volumes in the wastewater, which is a, another another mystery to be solved. But um, yeah, but it's, 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 it's a shame that, that that's something that's been cut back, I think, because that is a, it's, a, it's a nice kind of agnostic, uh, you know, surveillance tool. Um, yeah, and we, yeah, I mean, the point that we can look for other viruses is really great. I mean, we we have the potential to identify almost any virus in wastewater, uh, mm -hmm. and so it, it could be developed as an incredibly useful tool uh, using some of the more agnostic methods that we have for sequencing now. So, if I had control of the budgets, we'd be doing more with our wastewater and more. Uh, I, I, I could only just note it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, I've been discussing this with a few people. Emma may wish to comment on this. I think this is a very weird idea. The idea is that, OK, if we do have more variants that are severe and cause severe disease, we'll be able to spot them as long as we keep analysing patients in hospital. And that's a bit like, you know, talking you know, about closing the barn door once the horse mm -hmm. is bolted sort of thing. But I don't know if Emma, what Emma's view is of that, because clinically it's an interesting idea. Of course, you get people in hospital who've got severe disease associated with COVID and then you identify variants that way and I guess that's the place where PCR testing is continuing. Mm. Um, yes yeah, so there has been modelling done on that and um, there's a substantial delay associated with um, identifying variants of concern if you use hospital data um, as your mainstay uh, and um, that that has been shown quite clearly. Mm. Uh, so um, yeah I, I, I guess it's it's something but once we have people in hospital, I'm not sure that we need sequencing to tell us that people might end up in hospital, if that makes sense. You know, we, we could be using it as a more preventative tool. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah, that's 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 a really important point, too. I'm going to move us slightly on to long COVID because <clears throat> really interested to know what you think the impact of the different variants is on mutations and on long COVID and there's a question from Nick Allen says although Omicron is less severe are we seeing instances of an increase in long COVID cases due to this variant so any thoughts? Well, there's been some a publication recently uh, for some uh, ONS data this is mainly with people infected with BA.1 and BA.2 I haven't seen any data yet on BA.5 but this demonstrates that approximately I think it's around four percent of triple vaccinated adults reported experiencing long COVID 12 weeks after being infected with with the uh, BA.1 and BA.2. So there's no reason to believe, sadly, that, uh, um, that BA.5 will be any different in terms of um, uh, effects of, of long COVID. So, so just to check, are, uh, is there any difference, do we think, between the incidence of long COVID and the variants, or is it pretty much the same? There's been some some others may Tom and Emma may know better, but looking at the data, there's there's some indication that early on some of the previous events were resulting in higher levels of long COVID. It's 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 complicated, obviously, by the impact of vaccination, which we know does offer some protection, and by the impact of repeat infection, which we know can result in long COVID. But I know that data again, going back to the ONS data, if you looked at double vaccinated people, then 
it was quite clear that Delta was much more severe in terms of um, long COVID compared to right. BA.1. Right. Um, so I think there is a sense that early on there was more severe long COVID, but of course, to say that's complicated now by um, by the impact yeah. of vaccination. Yeah. Tom, do you want to come in? I know, I know there's been some uh, changes in symptomology as well between the different variants. So, you know, for, for example, the, one of the, one of the, you know, very well, uh, well, well, not well understood, but well described um, long COVID is, is, you know, the prolonged anosmia, for example, and that does seem to have changed generally between the different variants. And, and maybe, you know, there's some, there's some, you know, maybe it's a tropism thing. It's, it's infecting different kinds of cells that are causing that in a different way, but, um, but it's, that these these data, I mean, the, the, the sorts of studies that you need to be able to pick this apart are, are difficult, and obviously they only, you know, the, 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 you only find out this stuff quite a long time after the fact because it takes a while to, well, for it to be long COVID, it has to be a certain amount of time after the initial infection and stuff, and you have to be able to confirm the initial infection. Um, but yeah, I, I it's yeah, I, I think it's very complicated. The picture is very complicated at the moment about uh, if there's differences in between the variants and what exactly these differences are and, and how consistent these are between studies and stuff. There are lots and lots of questions, which is brilliant. <laughs> and I'm aware that I'm probably not going to get through them all if I if I turn to all of you. So if I read a question and you want to answer it, if you could just physically wave at me, let's not bother with that with that yellow hand thing. It'll be easier if you just wave. So oh, what about this one from Issa to SAR? Mutation and possibly reassortment propel SARS-CoV-2 to be rapidly evolving, implying that human defense tactics need to be reconsidered if we are to overcome the pandemic. That might just be a comment, but if anyone wants to say anything. No. I, can have a yeah. quick, I can have a quick thing. So um, a re recombination is something the coronavirus is really, really like doing. So um, the idea that you have co-infection, super infection, and you, uh, you know, the viruses basically shuffle around genes. It's almost like, like sexual reproduction for viruses, whereas normal virus reproduction is asexual. They just make a copy of themselves. Um, so particularly in the Omicron era, there has been a lot of recombination, um, but it is worth saying that at the moment they haven't had a huge impact on, you know, they've always come quite late into a wave. And then generally, along with the parental viruses, they've been wiped out with by whatever comes along. So for example, BA1, BA2 recombinants have been outcompeted now by BA5. Um, but that is definitely something that we need to keep a close eye on because it is entirely possible that a really nasty recombinant could come along and uh, that, that, that has properties of two of these variants, for example, um, and, and uh, you know, the immune escape of the, the one that people worried about was the immune escape of Omicron with the virulence of, of Delta, for example, um, uh, and, 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 and become predominant. So this is something we really do need to keep an eye on, uh, recombinants. That's interesting. Uh, are the variants B4 and 5 more able to infect infants? Do we know that? Anybody know that? We don't know. We don't know. Good question. Don't then. know that. <laughs> the answer. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to uh, monoclonal antibodies. A question from Andrew Simon Baum. Please, can you address the monoclonal antibody question in relation to prophylaxis, where circulating viral load is zero, and therefore efficacy is likely retained for longer, i.e., Evershield? Are we reaching the limit of prophylaxis, prophylaxis efficacy for Evershield? Is that another good question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, Evershell is very interesting because it is, I, I believe it's the only one in the UK that is used as a, as a prophylaxis. But, but I, I, the, uh, the issue with it, though, is I don't think it's licensed for a, a post, you know, post exposure like the other monoclonal, you know, like an um, infusion and stuff. But it, it, it works quite well against some of the variants. So it's a shame that it isn't being used for that purpose as well. It could, in theory, be used for both. But I believe it's only licensed for one as as. I remember correctly, or, or that was the case anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, the problem with monoclonals is that they they target parts of the virus which are highly variable, and so they. I imagine that the companies must know that they are likely to have a sort of limited shelf life in the in the face of high levels of transmission in the community, and um, uh, and ongoing 
diversification of the virus. One, one reason to try to limit transmission is because we generate variants when we have high levels of transmission. And, um, and these will become increasingly uh, resistant to monoclonals and they, uh, you know, unless, rather like vaccines, unless we can manage to uh, attack Achilles heels of the virus, which, uh, you know, areas that are conserved and the virus can't change them, um, becomes catastrophic for the virus to try to alter them um, uh, through random mutation, of course, not through, <laughs> not through free will, but uh, um, uh, if that can't happen, then, you know, we will see ongoing need for ongoing development of treatments and so on. And actually some treatments may be, have a longer shelf life than others because they work in different ways. So, you know, treatments which uh, regulate the immune response, for example, are very likely to have a very long lasting effect. Mm -hmm. Whereas monoclonal antibodies are, are unfortunately, as the virus changes, um, uh, they will become less useful. Mm -hmm. I guess we should also think about in this context antiviral drugs. I know that there's obviously a lot more data now on Paxlovid and some interesting issues about rebound, but it's quite clear that that is one of a number of drugs that are, uh, are quite effective in managing in managing COVID. And I guess we need to see more widespread application um, as is going on in the States at the moment, actually, of, 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 the, of, of antiviral drugs. And the hope is there'll be some new antivirals coming along shortly and we might not be faced with the same issues um with monoclonal antibodies although we always have to be aware of of resistance and coming back to the same issue about the the achilles heel can you target uh, a particular part of the virus with a drug that isn't going to be as susceptible to selecting for drug resistance i'm going to give you my final question now so you can think about it <laughs> the final question is going to be in five years time to have this under control what will we need to have in place? So you can you can put that on the back burner because I'm going to go back to some of these other questions. There are a few here uh, again about vaccination, which I know we've touched on, but uh, it's uh, it's hard to to scroll through these in the right order. So uh, my sir, nasal vaccine is in trials, and we mentioned nasal vaccines before. How many others is the question? Well, I don't know if anybody's got any ideas. There, there, are, there are quite a number. I know, and I think there are about at least a dozen or so different trials in in a number of different countries. And again, what this reflects is, dare I say, it, a lack of coordination about what's going on here. And of course, this is a, again a product of the complexity of trials, as we all know, and also the complexity of of um, a farm, a pharma and biotech in terms of the way that they deal with these things. But there, there are quite a number actually. Um, but, but I, I'm, I'm sure it's at least a dozen different trials. Um, of nasal vaccines and we've used nasal vaccines haven't we for for children and flu so yeah, they, they, yeah certainly much there's always been this be... issue about you know, from the very beginning here about the the fact that we haven't in fact focused enough on the mucosal immune response um and that's okay i mean in the rush to get a vaccine with obviously it was a great job in being able to protect so many people from from severe disease and us that was fantastic and of course i don't think anybody predicted that the the spike-based vaccines would be as successful as they have been, which is fantastic, of course. But in terms both of the need to generate mucosal responses and long-term effects, I think what we're going to see with vaccine development is vaccines are not only targeting spike, but as targeting other parts of the virus, not only in terms of antibodies, but giving more long-lived um, T-cell responses as well as B-cell responses. So the nasal vaccine isn't just about convenience and ease of, of administration. It's likely to improve our response is, is that yeah and i think there's the, the other the other side of this coming back to long covid of course is long covid we know is a spectrum or, or an amalgamation of different different diseases but there's one particular area in the gut that's that, that is seems to be susceptible to infection and to possibly to virus persistence it's, a, it's very controversial but if you could generate a, a, an immune response in the mucosal in the gut in, in, in the gut then you might protect people from what, from some of the, um, the effects of, of long COVID. Mm, interesting. Uh, how is the poor vaccination rate in less developed countries affecting mutation rates? If it is, I suppose, is is it? And and yeah, who would like to pick that one up? Go on, Emma. Um, I guess I could pick that one up by saying that I think most people now in low and middle income countries will have been infected. And so um, the, the population immunity is going to be based on previous infection rather than 
vaccine uh, in people who haven't been able to access vaccines. Um, and it, it was a different picture earlier. We could have acted earlier with international uh, production of vaccines and, and uh, making sure that everyone in the world had access to them. And we should have done that. And we should be looking at um, improving pathways to allow us to do that in the future as well, not just for those people in those countries, but also for ourselves. Because unfortunately, as a, you know, when you look at all the variants that have developed, they've occurred in countries with very high transmission rates, the first of which, of course, was the UK with Alpha. Um, but subsequently, there have been variants um, which have emerged in southern Africa and in India and other parts of the world, Brazil, during periods of very high transmission. And so we, if we had acted earlier, um, we might have done a lot better. <laughs> uh, now that we haven't acted, um, most people will have been exposed and so they will have had exposure to different variants and actually the immunity in different parts of the world is going to be a little bit different. So we know that the, um, the way in which the virus may evolve now in different geographical areas will be affected by which variants people have been exposed to. And that varies at a, a um, kind of continent level, but also even at a country to country level. So you know, even different countries in, in Europe have had different exposures to uh, sublineages of Omicron, for example. And uh, one of the things that I was going to say earlier was that I think we do need to try to, to do some prediction work. Uh, we're not good at it, mm -hmm. but um, we there are ways in which we might be able to train not the virus, because that would, might be a dangerous type of activity, but to train um systems um, which have use safe sort of pseudovirus systems to uh, make the virus evolve under antibody pressure uh, and try to predict what might come next. But of course, those are highly experimental. I think that's what we should be trying to do, though, in the next few years. Interesting. While we're talking about immunity, there's a question from Chris Davidson. Does the fact that people are becoming infected more than once indicate that the concept of herd immunity does not apply. And, uh, and linked to that is how long is immunity lasting? Is it, is it? Because I think we must all know people that have had it more than once and perhaps we thought that we'd only get it and we'd be done with it. So, so herd immunity, length of immunity, any thoughts on that? Emma, I think. You know, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, people use herd immunity in different ways. So yeah. <laughs> that, that's the first thing to say. However, herd immunity is what we're aiming for with vaccination plus exposure uh, in the population. And uh, it means that there might be a high enough rate uh, of immunity in the population that um, that people would now. This is the question with the herd immunity. Do you mean that the outcome is that you uh, get rid of hospitalizations and deaths or does it mean that you get rid of infections? And um, I think the concept of herd immunity actually was first described with relation to symptomatic disease. And mm -hmm. so um, <laughs> we're now in a different era where we can actually detect asymptomatic disease. And, and we kind of like to think about prevention of infection. I, I don't think we're going to be able to prevent completely infection at this point. Um, and I guess herd immunity would mean that we would be stopping people getting ending up in hospital. We haven't yet done that. So we're not at a point of herd immunity from that from that perspective. But of course, there is a very high rate of um, immunity in the population. And most people at this point, if they've been vaccinated and they keep up with vaccines, do have a, a significant degree of protection. Um, so it, it's tricky, <laughs> um, but uh, that, that's what we're trying to do with vaccination effectively. There's a, a more technical question here from Andrew McCutcheon. Some reports say nuclear capsid protein is the important antigen for induction of good T cell response. Has nuclear capsid changed over time? Would vaccines be more effective if they deliver this antigen? Tom, do you want to do that one? Yeah, I can maybe answer the first part of that. So there has been mutations in nuclear capsid over time. Um, each, of the, each of the variants has some degree of mutations in there. Um, uh, Omicron, for example, does have a mutation at a fairly potent T cell epitope, I believe, um, in, in nuclear capsid, which, which has turned up in chronic infections and stuff as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I guess you just you'd want to test that, right? If you're, uh, you you want to put it into your your animal, your preclinical models, or something to see if, if you think that's that's what's going to get you uh, the, the T cell. 
stuff. I mean, it's trying to design from a T cell vaccine point of view is is tricky though, because you know, un unlike antibodies, where most people make antibody responses against the same sort of epitopes, there's a lot of variability in your HLA haplotypes. It's an incredibly complex area, and for other viruses, other similar respiratory viruses like T cell. The, the issue with T-cell vaccines has always been that they work great in your lab mice, but when you put them into you know, human or, or, or more complex uh, models, they, they tend to not work so well. Um, it is, is my feeling from the flu field. I don't know if that would be the same for SARS-CoV-2 though. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on to an another question that we've touched on before. Maynaz Qureshi says, what is your take on pushing the natural virus life cycle to, due to vaccination? And we, I, I think I mean, you mentioned this, that because we've been interfering, because we've been changing things, it makes it perhaps harder to predict what's going to happen to the natural virus life cycle, although we might argue that that's complicated and unpredictable anyway. Um, Lawrence, anything you'd like to I think, we've, I think I think we've already already covered that. It, yeah. it, it is really extremely unpredictable, particularly in a population, yeah. a worldwide population with different levels of 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 immunity. And the question is, what's driving the fitness of this? I I always felt, and I'm not, I'm, 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 Tom may wish to comment on this, that we we were sort of reaching peak transmissibility with these variants, and that somehow the only place to go then is immune evasion. But whether we've actually got to that point, that tipping point, you know, how far can this virus go? What we're seeing is some reversion, some revertent mutations in spike, which are making that more infectious. So this idea again about tropism and changing tropism in terms of upper respiratory tract versus lower respiratory tract. The virus is changing all the while. Are we going to get to a position where we do get a virus that is highly transmissible um, or has reached that peak transmissibility and then... We're going to go down the immune evasion rate. Well, that doesn't seem to be happening. We're getting both of these things going on at the same time in a very, very unpredictable manner. And I think that's likely to be the pattern for the foreseeable future. There's a specific question here about BA5. Obviously, interest in that. This is Ian Semple. Could the panel talk about whether any mutations in BA5 are linked to increased transmissibility or pathogenicity? Yeah, that very, very complex question because it's 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 still although yeah, there there are some there, there's it's not clear yet from the data. There are there's some study sets suggesting it may be more pathogenic. There are some studies suggesting it's similar pathogenicity to BA2, um, both from you know animal studies in the lab and from large epi studies. Um uh, the, 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 it's hard to say. I mean, it ha does have a few mutations. That the, the other the other complicated factor is that there was BA4 and BA5 which emerged at the same time, and BA4 largely caused the wave, or along with BA5, largely caused the wave in South Africa, the recent one. But BA5 is the one that internationally has done very well, and there is some suggestion that BA4 uh, BA5 may actually be a more fit virus than BA4, which is very <laughs> complicated because they have identical spikes more or less. <laughs> Uh, and everyone tends to think of things in terms of the spike protein. So then that means it has to be something outside of the spike. And really our understanding of that from a virological perspective is, is very, very poor. So it's, 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 it's very messy. And I don't think we're there at trying to say, you know, well, even if this, even if there is a difference, but if there is a difference, what's causing it? Um, I, I don't think it's clear at all. And, and, and there's conflicting data. There's a recent report from Portugal, which indicates higher rate of, hospitalization with BA.5 infection versus BA.2, post, that's post-vaccination and booster, along with um, significantly in increased risk of reinfection. That same study looked at vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization, and that reduced from about 93% with BA.2 to 77% with BA.5. Um, again, difficult to tease apart when you're looking at these different populations, but again, a suggestion that, that BA.5, it, it, it does give a, it is not, it's not, um, it's not less severe, certainly, than, than B2. And, uh, I mean, some of that can be explained. I mean, we understand now that um, when Omicron emerged, there was a fundamental change in phenotype. It was almost like a completely new virus. It probably should be a sort of different, described as a, a different virus in some ways, because it enters cells differently. And um, that comes through change in the largely in the S2 domain of spike, but also other parts of spike as well that uh, may affect the behavior of the virus. 
<laughs> Tom, um, we, we published some data on this and then Tom went a bit further and found like a single amino acid change can actually make a massive difference to tropism. You might want to talk about that, Tom, but I mean, if that single change can have that kind of impact on the way that the virus behaves and if the way the virus behaves is closely related to how it gets into cells. So Delta can get into cells through slicing um, the spike into a nice conformation to get directly into cells by interacting with a protein called TMPRSS2. Um, whereas Omicron has to get into cells, uh, has to be encapsulated by endocytosis and get in in a kind of vehicle, if you like. And then it has to escape from that through the activity of enzymes called cathepsins. And, and um, that seems to me to be a more complicated pathway. And it also sort of fundamentally changes the tissue tropism of the virus because TMPRS is two expression and so on, it's different, different cell types. And so if the virus can make a single change uh, and that can affect the way it gets into cells and the tropism of the virus, that's uh, quite concerning. And uh, we, we are in no way able to be sure that the virus is evolving in a, in a more friendly way. I mean, Tom might want to add to that because you, you demonstrated that. Yeah, no, really you, nice you, work. <laughs> no, you've completely covered what, what we, I mean, that's the other reason we're slightly afraid of, certain, you know, recombinants, because in theory, a recombinant could just trade out that entire part of the, the protein for a version that doesn't do that. So the fact that it's a modular thing, essentially the virus can just switch and, and we think maybe could revert to virulence uh, in, in a fairly easy way, if it, if it so wished to. It, but obviously it's only going to do that if it gives the virus an advantage in transmission, uh, because the virus doesn't care about, uh, you know, doesn't care about pathogenicity at the end of the day. All it cares about is transmissibility. Um, so it's, it's whatever the gets the virus more, more transmissible will determine whether or not it selects for higher or lower or the same severity. In the interests of efficiency, I hope, I'm going to pull some questions together. So there's a question around terminology. We talk about variants, not strains, as we do for other things. Is there a reason for that? And then bearing in mind that uh, it's also unpredictable in terms of the new variants that appear. Should we be doing more to, to prevent that? So there's a practical question around, should we be wearing masks again? And are, are vaccines helping is another question. Are vaccines helping reduce transmissibility and therefore have that added benefit rather than just the individual health? So terminology, masks, transmissibility. We'd like to start. I'd go for terminology very quickly. Um, <laughs> I mean, nearly everything's fairly arbitrary, to be honest, and it's just whatever people started calling stuff stuck. So for SARS-CoV-2, we have lineages, we we have variants, um, but there's there's been you know there's been discussions whether Omicron should be a sero a different serotype because it's so antigenically distinct, um, uh, and I think you know a lot of that you can basically choose whichever virus you like and say point to it and say well these viruses are different as each other but they're called strains when you do this. Um, but but it's 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 really just whatever the community starts calling stuff and what sticks. Um, so it's, yeah, it's fairly arbitrary to be fairly honest. Fairly random variation there. Okay, right. So in terms of prevention, masks, vaccines, Emma. Well, vaccines do reduce transmission, um, not yeah. completely, but they reduce it. Uh, so yes, that that's definitely the case. Um, uh, but they don't reduce it to the point that people don't get infected um, always. So some people don't get infected, other people can get infected and have a milder infection. But it does also reduce their likelihood of transmitting. People can transmit who've been vaccinated, but uh, and we've, that's been quite well demonstrated, but uh, um, it, it does reduce it. Uh, I think the, we will have to live with measures um, uh, for, for a while and I, I hope that we're going to get better at those and maybe not go for the kind of blunderbuss approach which we can't really manage um, I think long term and start to think very carefully maybe at an individual sort of responsibility level about if you're you know if you're traveling during a peak in an airplane I think you should probably wear a mask <laughs> if you're walking outside during a peak I don't think you need to wear a mask and there are you know there are uh, in between situations and we may need to sort of get better at judging those risks. I think we've had a lot of um, exposure to understanding about what, what 
what is useful and what isn't. And uh, But I'd like to think we take a nuanced approach, but that we are reactive and that we do make sure to protect older relatives. I think, you know, for example, if you are, um, if there's a lot of transmission going on, you're going to visit your grandmother who's 90, you might want to run a lateral flow test before you go. And uh, those sorts of things, I think, are going to be with us for a long time. Yeah. There's, there's at least an evidence base now for, for, for mask wearing. Um, there are lots of studies now that demonstrate the benefits in terms of transmission. My view is as we're going to enter a very challenging autumn winter, because we're going to have, uh, sadly, this, this toxic mix of inevitably new, new COVID variants. Flu, if we look at what's going on in Australia during their flu season, they've had a really tough and they continue to have a tough flu season it's not surprising given what we've all been through over the last couple of years with on top of other respiratory virus infections it does make me concerned about the public health messaging over autumn winter again people wearing face masks particularly in crowded poorly ventilated spaces I get looked at as if I'm a madman when I go into my supermarket and pop on a face mask I still do that because uh, I also have an elderly father and I'm just being very concerned and but people look at me as if I'm from another planet now that this rather, rather liberal view. So I, I think we've, we've got to get the public health messaging right. And we've certainly got to think about this over the autumn winter months. That's a really good point. A couple of questions here about children. I talked about all the people. It says the US has now lowered again the age of vaccinating children to include very young ones. Will the UK be following suit? And someone else says, is there much value in vaccinating very young children, given that most children this age do not become extremely sick? Tom? I might, pass that to, I might pass that to Emma, actually. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can have a shot. At, I mean, um, so I think the data would suggest that um, the primary benefit uh, in vaccinating young children is actually to their caregivers and uh, those who are in contact with them and of course that benefits them as well and it stops you know school shutdowns and nursery shutdowns all sorts of other things um so uh, yes i mean we and we have increasing evidence that these vaccines um are very safe there are rare side effects no question as there are with any vaccine any medicine actually but uh, the, in, with com in comparison to others these are really, really quite safe vaccines, and therefore, I think we should be th thinking about it. But uh, you know, there, are, I'm sure that's uh, something that the GCVI will guide us on. Thank can you. I speak? Can I, can I speak from a very personal perspective? Well, I've just recently become a grandfather, and I'm absolutely paranoid about COVID and my young little granddaughter. And mm. we've been testing like mad. We've been restricting. My my son and daughter-in-law been very strict about it. But the idea of a baby getting infected with Omicron is horrific, as far as I'm concerned. And it, it is the way you behave is really important in that context. Yeah. And so so at what age does does the concern stop, Lawrence? When when <laughs> when well, I don't know that's an interesting thing. I mean, you know, I have to be careful here because I was one of the great advocates for getting vaccination into youngsters and had the most severe online abuse I can mm. that you can imagine. This was just yeah. This was just advocating vaccination five to 11 year olds. And indeed at that time, we weren't even vaccinating the under 15. So we've been very slow. Um, but as Emma says, we've got so much data now about the safety uh, mm. of these vaccines. And it's better. I was thinking about it this week, because again, my grand granddaughter has had her first eight week vaccination. You get a six in one vaccine and you get a couple of other. You think, well, is it such a terrible, you know, should we be thinking about that? Is it, if, if we know we can protect young, you know, these very little tots from, yeah. from infection, should we not be thinking about that? In the meantime, I think it's really important that we we do as much as we possibly can to keep lateral flow testing, etc. Mm -hmm. I'm going to slightly change the tone because there's an interesting question here. I just want to know how the guests feel about how we should react to the virus. What I mean, says the questioner, is that do we treat it like the flu? For example, do we tell patients that we had it or should it be hush, hush? Interesting question. As the <laughs> well, how do you feel about it? I, I'm certainly. Good. I, I'm not quite sure what the question was. There should we disclose that? Yeah. We, oh, yeah. Or I is think it, is it becoming a sensitive issue. I suppose the question is. Yeah. yeah. Well, I actually believe very much in the non-hierarchical interactions with patients, and that uh, if you've had something 
and they've got it. Sometimes the circumstances might be that we'll share that information um, with them and that can be helpful with the patient doctor relationship. So I'm not in favor of being hush hush if the moment is right. On the other hand, with these interactions, it's all about the patient and not about you. So there, there may be a, a kind of moments where it can be helpful. Um, I, I don't think it's shameful to be infected. And there's a lot of stigma associated with uh, um, infections of all types. For, and that seems to happen with any infection, any infection that I've dealt with in my career so far, people feel um, ashamed about being infected. So I think that we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't encourage that. I mean, viruses find a niche and they exploit it. And even with the best measures, we can't always be perfect. Um, I'm happy to disclose that I've had Omicron. I had it very recently, managed to escape it for ages. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, and particularly as the virus becomes better at infecting us, it gets even more difficult to avoid it. Well, I'm aware of the time and I'm aware there's lots more questions. Thank you to everyone that's contributed to, to, to the questioning. I've tried to go through as many as I possibly can. That my, my, finishing question was you know in five years time we've got this all under control what have we done to do that uh who'd like to start Emma oh I was I was you waiting you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay well I shall start in the I'll start with Lawrence you're top of my screen well we've talked a lot about very improved vaccines so I hope we're going to be in a position where I think it's very likely we're going to be set and the hope is, as with the common cold coronaviruses, that we will settle into some form of seasonality with this virus and would have come to some accommodation with it through continued vaccination, etc. I think we've been in a position where we will have very improved vaccines. Perhaps some of those will be administered nasally and provide that, that type of protection. We'll have better drugs as well. But I think what this highlights for me is that we can't be complacent about infection. We haven't talked about preparing for future pandemics, but... I've been concerned about this recently because, for instance, the monkeypox. Now, there's a thing is in today's nature. It's quite a nice editorial about wealthy countries avoiding the COVID-19 mistakes. You know, and again, here's a disease that we've ignored for years and thought, well, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't go on in the West. Um, have we learned lessons about other, you know, how we're going to manage other pandemics? And I think so. I think we'll settle down into some accommodation with SARS-CoV-2. But what does it mean for how we're going to manage future pandemics and as someone who trained in public health i i will often say i think we're brilliant at planning for a pandemic that's like the one we've just had but not necessarily a different one uh tom any thoughts on my five-year question yeah i mean I, I i completely agree with lawrence i think the only way we get this under better control is having better vaccines going forwards the, the vaccines we have at the moment are are, 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 are very good at keeping well fairly good at keeping people out of hospitals and that should you know if we can have some sort of framework for updating them quickly then that that should improve as well assuming that we can keep high uptake of them amongst the most vulnerable but but we'd need a different type of vaccine i think to to be able to you know have some semblance of control i think in, in three to five years and, and possibly that's the time frame and then yeah further antivirals and things like that are very good for you know keeping the severity of the infection low but they obviously don't really control the actual you know, virus spread thank you and finally emma last word to you well i would like us to start thinking about why pandemics start in the first place and i think that um, our intrusions into the natural world are really concerning I think our, uh, the fact that we were raising the temperature of the planet substantially is really concerning. Uh, the amount of travel that we do from one place to another, we need to reconsider it. And uh, that applies to us scientists and doctors as well. Um, if we can give a webinar, we probably should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, I, you know, this is, I think, live animal markets um, with multiple species next to each other is a danger to the world, not just to one country. And uh, I think that uh, we should be looking at that type of behavior as uh, humans on this planet that we share with other animals and that we, we don't do well at, at uh, letting other animals who may harbor these viruses and they usually are zoonotic or you know, these viruses usually do come from other species. 
um, that we need to live better in harmony and let them have their niche and uh, let us have ours. <laughs> but uh, we shouldn't be, we've got to be really thinking about these big questions. We do, we do. That could be a subject of a future webinar, couldn't it? Preventing pandemics for the future. Uh, I've run out of time. So thanks to those who put questions, but many, many thanks to the panelists or the guests, however you'd like to be termed. You've done a fantastic job over the last hour. So all that needs me, all I need to do now is to mention the upcoming programme that the RSM is about to, to host in September, Tackling Inequalities very relevant in relation to, to COVID as well as everything else. It's on Wednesday, the 14th of September. So if you're interested, please do sign up for that. So thank you again, and we'll see you soon.